Let me ask you to pray with me even as we go through the message. This is uh, not an easy message to preach. It's not going to be an easy one to hear. Uh, it is in the theme of thanksgiving, but it is thanking God for our salvation. In that, we are making a distinction between those who have really received Christ as Savior and those who have just become religious and would call themselves Christian. Now, whenever you do that, you uh, risk uh, causing someone who's uh, perhaps a new Christian, perhaps one that's not grown much in the Lord, <clears throat> to cause them to doubt their Christianity. I don't feel too bad about that. If there is that in you that has that doubt, maybe there's a reason for it. And so let me ask you to pray with me, even as I preach, <coughs> that the truth will come out. The truth will be seen. And uh, pray, especially if you who have been saved and, and are secure in that, uh, pray for those who need this message that may be saved from uh, a surprising sentence to hell. So search me, O oh God, and uh, there we go. The, uh, I'll show you the other side of the table tonight. I just wanted to show those cute faces. Search me, O oh God. Take this from Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me, this means test me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. This introduces the idea that we ought to ask God to search the depth of our heart. The way of the world is to be religious, be sincere, and then never doubt it. Trust that these religious trappings are enough, that you've said enough, that you've done enough, that you've labored enough, whatever, you've given enough, sung enough. And that's not what salvation is about. Religion is always talking about you doing and then thinking that that's enough. In reality, Salvation is something that God has done and you have received. The th seriousness of this is brought out in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Christ is speaking of a time that he knew was going to happen. And he said, not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Master, Master, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, not everybody's going to make it who thinks they're going to make it. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And doing the will of the Father was to receive the Son that the Father sent. You see. And then he gives this terrible example. Many will say to me in that day, because he's going to be the judge. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? We spoke words of prophecy in your name. You should be proud of us. And in thy name have cast out devils, demons. Um, I don't think I've ever done that. Prayed for it, but, uh, uh, you know, they had that experience. And in thy name done many wonderful works. Wonderful here indicates amazing things, miraculous things. And with that glowing testimony, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Christ has this image that there is a tree that's supposed to be delivering fruit. But every year, without fail, the fruit is rotten. The fruit is corrupt. 
Now, it's not just a bad year. You have a bad year, you, you drill around and you water it deeply and put the fertilizer in and you try to make that tree as good as it can be. But this tree, upon investigation, is found that at the heart of the tree, the tree itself is corrupt. And he says, well then, this tree needs to be cut down and burned in the fire. He says, you have many evidences of fruit here, but it has all come from a corrupt tree. Therefore, nothing of this impresses me. And he calls all that they did iniquity, sin. Because the sin is the sin principle in us since our birth. Christ points this out to the religious leaders of his day, Matthew 23, 23. Woe unto you. It's going to be bad for you. Scribes, these were the copiers of the scripture. Pharisees, hypocrites. This is the word that means play actor. You're playing at this. For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. They've gone out to their garden, measured it out, and cut a tenth off and give it to God. These are dedicated people, religiously dedicated. But he says, you have omitted the weightier matters of the law, the more important matters of the law. Judgment, which is justice, mercy, and faith. He says, now this tithing thing, you ought to have done that and not to leave the other undone. He says, if you are truly saved, you will be a giver. You will be a person who uh, does the right thing. You'll be busy about the things of God, but you're not a Christian because you're busy about the things of God. A Christian will be, but that's not what makes you a Christian. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says to this church, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. He says, put yourself to the test. Prove it. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Now, our Calvinist friends have thought that reprobate means people that God refuses to choose for salvation, but that's not what it means. It's a basically a simple word meaning found unapproved. It's when you take what you dug up out of the earth and look at it and say, sorry, it's not gold, it's fool's gold. You see, it's not approved. And the last verse I want to share with you in this introduction is 2 Thessalonians 3, 2. That we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for, and here's the sadness, no, all men have not faith. I was just uh, listening to music on the radio and this, uh, this wonderful song was written by somebody who said, uh, there are many, many religions but only one God. And the implication in this, this song was that they're all looking at this, but, but they're missing the point. It's only one God, see. Of course, unless you're Hindu, then many, many gods. But the uh, whole idea here is that they think that all these religions are just as good as one another. And they, they are, because they're all false, except for the one revealed in the Bible, which is the true Christian faith. So where does the thanksgiving come in here? Well, let's look at Psalm 118, 21. I will praise thee. And why? For thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Let's recognize that not everybody who walks into a church who rests on padded pews <laughs> is saved even if they come to church regularly. See. And it could be that you might be here having made a decision sometime before 
that you ought to go to church. Maybe you're here because you think uh, this is the way, way a, a good Christian should be. And that somehow you are working your way into Christianity. But Christianity comes by a decision to believe the Bible, that you are a sinner, and because of sin you are condemned, and without receiving Christ, there's nothing you can do to correct it. That your only hope is to be saved by the work of Christ. Then praise thee, thou hast heard me, and become my salvation. God becomes your salvation, not your works. And so the focus of this is that God's greatest gift to us is our salvation. We often focus on the pleasures of life and thank him for that, and, and we should, for we deserve nothing but heartache and pain and uh, sorrow, but that's what we deserve, but he gives us so much more. But through this alone, this salvation that he gives us, we enter into our new life. So let us, with these scriptures that I read to you, let us submit to God's all-knowing search. Search me, O God, search me. Now, why do some people call themselves Christians, but, as Paul said to the Corinthians, they're reprobates? Why do they think they're Christians when actually they're found unapproved by God? Well, let me share the thoughts of this. Number one, the state of the unsaved man. Let's look at an unsaved person. And in this, we're going to recognize that he is a tripartite being. Man is a union of his body, soul, and spirit. Now, an early mistake promoted by the Reformed theologians is making of the soul and spirit to mean the same thing. It's just two different words for the same thing, they say. They see man as only a two-part being. He's material and he's spiritual. But the Bible makes a distinction in this. For instance, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That seems to be pretty, pretty clear. Now, a little less obvious is 1 Corinthians 15, 44 and 45. Let me enhance the words uh, in the Greek meaning. It, the body, is sown a natural. Uh, sown here is um, like you would bury a seed in the ground. You bury the dead body. It is sown a natural body. Translated natural, but the actual word is the, uh, the adjective for soul, the soulish body. This means uh, a body that was only dominated by the soul. It is raised, the Christian's body is raised, a spiritual body, a body dominated by the spirit. There is, contrast, a natural, a soulish body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Quickening means one that makes alive. So what are the distinctions? Well, the spirit in the natural man, the unsaved man, the soulish man, the spirit is dead. It's there. It's like a, a, a radio that, get, that is broken, so it doesn't get any reception. And God resurrects the spirit at the moment of salvation. The uh, idea of man being dead is not speaking of the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. It's not talking about that. That's active in, in unsaved people. 
but it is talking about the Spirit. Here's the examples. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened, meaning made alive, who were dead in trespasses of sin. What was dead? Not your mind, not your ability to choose, not your ability to feel. That's the soul, the highest part of the natural man. But it was the Spirit that was dead. Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened, made us alive, together with Christ, by grace, or by whose grace you are saved. And then Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in your sins, back in the past, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The Bible speaks of the fact that the unsaved man's spirit exists, but it's just dead. It's... it's uh, without power to accomplish what it could be. This is why we hear people say, follow your heart, because they think that's, that's the highest part of man. They think it's the better part. But the Bible's pretty clear. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart that you want to follow is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't even figure out your heart, he says. So don't trust it. That's the spirit. Then, uh, so the soul is the highest part of the unsaved man. 1 Corinthians, uh, I, I jumped over all that. 1 Corinthians 2.14, let's notice that right there in the middle. It says, but the natural, meaning the soulish man, receiveth not the things of the spirit of God. The receiver isn't working. The spirit is the receiver of the things of God. The soul alone doesn't have that. Your, your mind, will, and emotions is the highest part of man. It makes, makes him above the animals. But it doesn't allow him to receive the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness. The mind doesn't make sense of it. The will can't choose what he doesn't make sense of. And the uh, the ability to choose and uh, feel good about it emotionally uh, are confused because he doesn't understand it. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can, here's the word meaning ability, neither can he know them. The unsaved man then cannot know the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. You have to have an active, resurrected, a live spirit to pick up the things of the spirit. And that's why we see people thinking they're talking about the spirit when they're actually talking about the soul. All right. It's a good thing to understand that even the soul is also tripartite. I've been talking about it. The soul is made of what we might call the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, the meaning here is that the mind is not the same thing as the brain. The brain is that thing that if you crack open your skull, you could take that brain out. Oh, you don't want to do that, but I'm just saying. It's a physical thing. It's, it's that organ that lives in your head. But it really doesn't make any sense. Uh, thinking, they tell us, is this electrical current that flashes through the organ of our brain. Well, how is that controlled, see? It, shouldn't the brain just be firing off, just doing its thing, you know, doing its glandular thing? And, and so we would, the, all the thinking would be put upon us. It's doing its own thinking, see, if, that's, if that was actually thinking. But, but we think about things, and then we rethink about things, and we doubt our thoughts. And this is the mind using the brain. <laughs> then the will is the ability to choose, to weigh things, the mind weighing, and then to choose. Important decisions, chocolate or vanilla, you know. And then emotions are the feelings that drive us in life. Um, not the love of God, that's, that's a decision to do the loving thing, but... Uh, the, the loving feelings that we get and um, uh, things we, we love, uh, some certain kind of music or we uh, love the way things look or whatever. 
the appreciation of beauty and all of that mess is uh, part of our emotions. So this is the state of the unsaved man. With that, these unsaved people whose life is not approved of God think they're Christians. So let's look, secondly, at the three reprobates of salvation, the three unapproved minds that are uh, not actually saved. The first one I'm going to call the mind Christian, but the Christian is in quotes. The mind Christian. Now, I um, am indebted to Henry School in his book, The Life of God in the Soul of Man. Now, he's one of the Reformed who thought that soul was the highest part. Yet he actually speaks of the affections, which is technically our understanding of soul. And uh, when he says soul, he really means spirit. So I have to interpret him. But he analyzed this very well. Sewell said this about what I'm calling the mind Christian. He says some who think they're saved, placing it, placing salvation in the understanding. They think if they understand certain things, if they have in their mind certain things, they have become Christians. He said in the orthodox, orthodox in, in the technical term means correct doctrine, in orthodox notions and opinions, and all the account they can give of their religion is that they are of this mind or this and the other persuasion. I believe in this, I believe in that. And he says, have joined themselves to one of those many sects wherein Christendom is most happily, unhappily divided. If you think I have learned enough that I have become a Christian, then you're not a Christian. You are a mind Christian, but that's reprobate not found approved. Secondly, let's look at the will Christian. Skugel again says this, others place it, salvation, in the outward man in a constant course of external duties. This is choosing to do good things. And a model of performances. If they live peaceably with their neighbors, keep a temperate diet, observe the returns of worship, frequenting the church or their closet for prayer, and sometimes extend their hands to the relief of the poor, they think they have sufficiently acquitted themselves, but they're reprobate. They're found unapproved. Perhaps you know the name George Whitfield. He was known as a great preacher in England, he came over to the United States and preached here. Uh, he was a friend with uh, Benjamin Franklin, although Franklin rejected his Christianity. But a man who was just remarkable, he uh, preaching out in the open field and somebody said, ah, shot up through a rock and hit him in the head, just knocked him out flat. And the wound was bad enough that they thought maybe he was dead. And uh, so they were mopping him up and and he, he roused back up, and they said, oh, we thought you were dead. He says, no, I can't be killed till, till God's done with me. <laughs> so a mighty Christian. But he wanted to be a Christian before he was a Christian. But God didn't give him any settling in the heart. And so John uh, uh, and uh, Charles Wesley had been given a book, Henry Schugel's The Life of God in the Soul of Man. And they said, friend George, you need to get a, alone with yourself and read this book and understand that how close you can be. You could be a mind Christian. You could be a, a, a will Christian by doing right things and not be saved. You won't have the life of God in your, in your spirit. And so he did, and he got saved. And that was how he got saved, by understanding the truths of this book, the truths of the Bible through this book. And the third idea then, a will Christian, is the emotions Christian. You know this type of person, don't you? Schugel again says, others again put all religion in the affections. 
in rapturous hearts. Oh, I'm, I'm so taken with the things of God, you see. And ecstatic devotion, mystical feelings of, oh, the, I read this in the Bible and it made me think of this and so on. And they all, and all they aim at is to pray with passion and think of heaven with pleasure and to be affected with those kind and melting expressions wherewith they court their Savior till they persuade themselves they are mightily in love with him and from thence assume a great confidence of their salvation, which they esteem the chief of Christian graces. This is the people whose heart is longing for some experience and lo and behold, they work at it, they have an experience, they have a flash of light, they have a pulse of emotion and they say, I've got it, I finally got it. See? Just emotions, just emotions. You could be a mind Christian because you think I've learned certain doctrines, a lot more than other people, in fact. You could be a will Christian because you say, I am dedicating myself to my good deeds, God's work. Or you could be an emotional Christian where your, your heart just is inflamed with the things of God and you think that settles it, but you are reprobate. Well, how are we to think about these people? Let's look at evaluating the reprobates. There are the good and the bad. There are decent people all around us. People who grew up in big denominational churches that never preached the Bible. When we came to this building, there was Sunday school material. And I thought, well, let's see if there's anything good in this. And it was specifically anti-gospel. Even when it was dealing in the Sunday school literature, even when it was dealing with the words of Christ that were specifically saying you need to receive Christ, they interpreted it as something else. I gathered it together, I gave it to Brother Dave Tunis, I said, Burn this, bury it, throw it away, shred it. Uh, don't let it get in the hands of anybody else. This is poison. The church was teaching this, you see, because the church wasn't Christian, whatever they called themselves. But there are the good. Why are they the good? If they're not Christian, why are they good? Well, number one, they have not gone to the gross sins of the pagan world. Something has kept them from this. Something perhaps within their own background. Something perhaps uh, within their early training. But they, uh, they would say, oh, no, 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 I, I don't go into that kind of stuff. And so they are good because they have not done the gross sins of the world. And secondly, they have gravitated to the arena of Christian influence. They say, I, I like what we have here at this church. We like these people. We like these things. We like this concept. We like this idea of enshrining decency. They've gravitated to the arena of Christian influence. But notice this, that these preferences are not salvation, but they resemble Christian salvation. This makes them, especially to themselves, look like the people who say they're Christians. And so they identify. I can be a Christian as much as they're a Christian, but they're looking at the outward performance. Now, in this state, number three, they should examine themselves and find their true need. If you're counting on what you have learned, you're a mind Christian and you're not approved. If you're counting on the things you've done, you are a will Christian but not approved. And if you're counting on an inflamed heart in love with God alone, 
then you're an emotions Christian, but unapproved. What about the bad? What about the people that are just out for whatever they can get and no sin seems to phase them? You don't tell me what to do. Well, their sin principle is still dominant. Let's look at the bad here, okay? The bad. Their sin principle is still dominant. There is ruling within them a sin principle. Romans 6.14, contrasting what it was with what it is now to the Christian, the sin shall not have dominion over you who have been born again. You see what the, this implies, that sin does have dominance over those who have not received Christ. For you are not under the law but under grace. Well, you are under God's law and God's condemnation if you still have the sin principle. You have that principle of the rotten tree so that there are no good works. Even religious works are not counted as good. Now, John states this principle in striking terms. I'm going to just read it and then I'll, I'll soften it just a bit here. But 1 John 3, 6, 8, and 9. 8 and 9, yep. Whosoever abideth, lives, stays in him, in Christ, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Sounds pretty scary. Verse 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, brought forth, made, uh, introduced to the earth, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And he concludes, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born or has been born of God. Now, this sounds, in fact, like John says, if you're a Christian, you can't sin. I said I'll soften this a bit because each of these terms of committing is used, it uses a word uh, from which we get our English word practice. So it's not talking about a one-time thing that you did a sin. It is that your life practices sin. You are given to some sin and there's no getting around it because it still has dominance. It tells you what to do and you have no force against it. Just to be clear, we know that John does not mean that a Christian cannot sin because in the same book he says this, 1 John 1, 8, if we, these Christians he's writing to, say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In 1 John 1.10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. God says we're sinners. If we say we're not, we make him a liar. We're claiming God is lying. In 1 John 2.1, my little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He says, don't sin, but if you do. So there was no question in John's mind, certainly in his own life, that he had fallen into sin from time to time and probably still did. Something made him so angry he would wish something bad about people, you know. It happens while you're driving and stuff. <laughs> and he said, just deal with it. The difference is that when a true Christian sins, he can't, he can't live with that. He has to make it right before God. If they are unsaved, however, their fruit is corrupt. And I've been referring to this illustration, but we find it in Matthew 7, 17 and 18. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. And he makes this as a strict distinction 
A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. It's not made that way. Neither can. Not able a corrupt tree to bring forth good fruit. No matter how good it looks to you, no matter how good it looks on the outside, comparing it to everybody else's fruit, God says it's corrupt, and therefore good for nothing. When they, uh, people were accusing him of being, uh, uh, working with the devil, Matthew 12 to 33, he says, look, either make the tree good and the fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. You say, I like what you're doing, but you are, you're corrupt. He says, no, it doesn't happen that way. So, the bad, they're calling themselves Christians? Some of them, yes. Marching in parades for God-condemned activity. How do they rethink this? Well, they excuse their wickedness by relabeling. This is when you take a can of beans, but you put a label on it that says caviar or something else. You relabel it. You didn't actually change it, you just relabeled it. Now let me poke at you here. They label their sin of pride, they don't want to call it pride, they call it stubbornness. Or their sin of judgmental condemnation as Christian holiness and severity. I call it like it is. I'm just not going to put up with this sin. So. But you know what God says? 1 John 2.16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This pride that leads you to stubbornness and judgmental condemnation, you haven't got that settled yet. They label their sin of wrath as deserved judgment. I called it the right way. Or their sin of reviling, this is just reaming people out with their words, as Christian zeal. They're relabeling sin as something virtuous. But God says, James 1, 19 and 20. See if you can find a way to wiggle out of this. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You say, I'm a righteous Christian full of wrath. He says, well, you're not working the righteousness of God. Categorically, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. They label their sin of rebellion as irritation. I was just really irritated. God has given us a chain of authority. Chain of authority in the church, chain of authority in, in government, chain of authority in the home. You rebel against that? Well, I, it just irritated me, that's all. It's an excuse, it's a relabeling. Or their sin of insubordination, not doing what they're supposed to do. As Christian courage and resolution, I will not be moved. But God says, Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject, submit yourself unto the higher powers. Why? For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained, meaning ordered, of God. This is God's chain of command. When you rebel that, this is the, the idea that we pay attention to the laws of the land. In fact, 1 Peter 2.13, listen to how 
specific it is, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. This was the, the verse that I caught myself where that I had excused speeding. But here it was. Command of God, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme, and he goes on to even the lesser people on down. 2 Timothy 3.15. Am I right? No. Saving the reprobates. Let's go there. Saving the reprobates. How do we make this distinction clear? And this is certainly what I would like to do this morning. Well, explain the use of the soul. The soul is not listening to God, but it is something of the avenue to salvation, if you can catch the distinction. The Bible speaks of our work in leading others to salvation as what? Soul winning. Proverbs 11, 30b. He that winneth or taketh souls is wise. This is a, a widely used word, taketh. Uh, it's used to, to fetch, to bring, uh, to take as in a wife. Uh, therefore, sometimes translated as to marry. But it's the idea of winning something to yourself or taking something to yourself. That's the soul. So God has made the soul as our avenue to influence people toward salvation. So let's think about how that works. We win or take souls by teaching their mind the doctrines of salvation. We're not trying to make them into a mind Christian that you're going to get saved after you learn these six things, see. But we're going to teach them what God says about salvation. We see this in 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul talking about his testimony of Timothy. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, what God says, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. It's not learning the Scriptures that made him saved, because that had happened for, since he was a child. But it made him wise enough to look for it through faith. There's through faith in which is in Christ Jesus. That's how you got saved. But the mind has to recognize what's at stake. And so you share with them in their soul, in their mind, the doctrines of, the, of uh, salvation. Secondly, we move on. We add to this, we win or take souls by engaging their emotions. This is pretty much the idea of you see this as a truth but I want you to see that this applies to you. You should get excited about this. You should say this is what I want. This I desire this. We see this in Acts 2.37 the end of the sermon at Pentecost. Now when they, the audience, heard this they were pricked in their heart. You feel the emotions of that? They were pricked in their heart and said to one another and to the rest of the apostles, Oh no, brethren, what shall we do? There's despair in this. We have brought them to the place where they say, I'm condemned. I need what you're talking about. And we have engaged their emotions. But finally and ultimately we win or take souls by encouraging their will. Their choice. In John 1.12 it says, But as many received him, to them gave he power, or the right, or the uh, privilege, the authority, to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Here receiving is the same as believing on his name. 
it has just been saying that Christ came into the world, the world received him not, but as many as received him. You see, the, the opposite is, is what this receiving is all about. This is the welcoming of him. This is choosing to accept. Encouraging the will. Acts 2.41. After they ask the question, what shall we do? He tells them, then they that gladly received his word, that was a choice, were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So we educate their mind about the truth that God says, that they're not saved, they were born unsaved, then engage their emotions that now you're condemned before God and only the work of Christ can save you. There now, this applies to me. And then I like to take them to the, the verses that says, whosoever received him, whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you call? Will you call? Engaging their emotions, I like to take them to Revelation 21.8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers. And he ends up by saying, And all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then I would say to them, What does this verse say would happen to you if you were to die right now? And there's tendency here, because it's so serious, for them to kind of laugh it off. I guess I wouldn't make it. And I've had to train myself not to smile, not to make this soft at, with them at all, but to say, that's right. So where would you go? What does this verse say? And then they seriously would say, I'd go to hell. And I take them back to Romans six twenty three. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So there's a choice to be made. You bring them emotionally to the place where they want to do this and then you uh, lead them to make that will choice. At this point, you can reveal to them the salvation of the Spirit. That this isn't just changing their mind and changing their will and changing their emotions. This is where it's an awakening, a, a resurrection of their very spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.11 But such were some of you, talking about how you were when you were unsaved, but now it's changed. Now you are washed. Now you are sanctified, made holy. But you are justified. What a wonderful term. It means that God himself has declared you to be righteous, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The Holy Spirit now actually awakens your spirit and you have received the new birth. So reveal the salvation of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit now can work upon you and make your, you spiritually alive. And then open to them the true meaning of salvation. It's not, it's not reformation of life. You're going to live better. You're going to avoid the saloon. You see. Well, I think Christians ought to avoid that. But that doesn't make you a Christian. Opening the true meaning of salvation. God offers his very life for us. He offers us the chance to participate in his life. God offers his own righteousness to us. <clears throat> Romans 10, 3, For they, the rejecting Jews, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You see, the fact is, you don't need a reformed human righteousness. You don't need to be living according to every rule that you've ever heard to get saved. 
You need God's righteousness that has to be given. And it is. That's what your salvation is. Secondly, God offers his own nature. This sounds too much, but here it is. 2 Peter 1.4 whereby are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises, promises, that by these, by these promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature, of God's own nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. Through us. The corrupt tree has been renewed, changed into a good tree, escaping the corruption. And then finally, God offers his own ultimate love. He cannot love what is contrary to his nature. He can't love sin. He can't love those who are dominated by sin. In his love, he offers you salvation. But only after you have salvation can he then bestow that love. Can he give that love? John 17, 23. Listen to what love he's talking about. Christ is speaking. He's speaking to God the Father. I, Christ, in them, the people who are following me, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and that you have loved them as you have loved me. <laughs> Ultimate love we share. This is why we're called sons of God. Because he loves us as he loves his own son. We have been adopted into that family. Galatians 2.20. Paul doesn't just say it's a principle. He says it affected me personally. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who did do what? Who loved people in general? No, he said, loved me and gave himself for me. When that love becomes real to us, we said he did it for us. And John summarizes it for us, 1 John 4.10. Herein is love, not that we love God, it's not that emotional Christian concept, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God was not satisfied with us being dominated by sin. Propitiation means he's now satisfied. He's satisfied that the sins were paid for by Christ on the cross, and he counts us as Christ. Love. The dear, deep love of God. Thank God for your salvation, but search yourself. Ask God, search me, O oh God. Show if there's a wicked way in me. Let's pray. Father, we turn to thee then, because you have given, offered us the, the hope of salvation the hope of eternal life, the hope of being adopted into your family and to be in a loving relationship with you and others for all eternity. And Father, we dare not set this aside. We dare not trade this for, uh, for mind Christianity that says I will understand more than others or will Christianity that I will live better than others or emotional Christianity that says, I will love more than others. Father, we don't want an activated soul. We want a resurrected spirit. We want to have our spirit in tune with the Holy Spirit living within us. And then we have the new birth. We have true salvation. With heads bowed, eyes closed, it may be that you're saying, Pastor, I've considered myself a Christian, but maybe it's just that I thought I knew enough or I did enough 
or I felt enough. I want to turn over my complete being, mind and soul, mind and will and emotions, my entire soul, and have it won to Christ. By knowing the truth, accepting it means me, and then choosing to trust Christ as Savior. If that's your prayer, I wonder if you'd slip your hand up and say, pray for me. I need to know this, and I'd like to know it now. Pray for me. Yes, amen. Amen. Father, then we bow before you, knowing that you have told us how to be saved. It's not that great a mystery. It's just that the world has been telling us that it's a different way, that we may learn enough, that we may do enough or we might feel enough. But that's just the natural man. It's just the unsaved part of us. Help us then to abandon that and ask for the awakening of our spirit, the new birth, to experience the new birth by thy work of the Holy Spirit, opening our spirit, resurrecting it to new life. I pray, Father, for each one raising the hand or those who thought maybe they should and touch their hearts, bring them to salvation, open their heart as you did, Lydia. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.